Uh, my name is Stanton Rickey. I was a B-17 pilot in World War II, stationed in Italy with the 483rd Bombardment Group. Now the B-17 was a fascinating vehicle and uh, the, the head of the 8th Air Force Bomber Command, General Tui Spot said, without the B-17, we may have lost the war. At the Nuremberg trials, Albert Speer, who was the head of the German military production complex, said that oil, oil was the target, it was of the most value as far as taking the enemy to the, as far as crippling the enemy. We must understand that the 8th Air Force and the 15th Air Force were bombing targets in Germany and in the Balkans and different places at least two years prior to the invasion in 1944. Now, my 483rd Bomb Group deployed to Italy in March of 1944, and we commenced bombing targets like Budapest and uh, Ploesti. Ploesti, incidentally, was bombed by the by the 15th Air Force 27 times. I went there twice. Near Vienna, there was a Messerschmitt plant also cranking out Messerschmitt fighter planes, which is a, a, an attractive target. Now, as, as far as the air war was concerned, it, it was a killing field. We lost 36,000 killed in action in the air war and Europe alone and 40,000 40, were either parachuted out or crash landed in stricken airplanes and were picked up and finished the war as POWs. I was one of those. Now the 483rd Bomb Group suffered casualties to this extent. 40% of the people that deployed to Italy in March of 1944 were shot down. That will give you an idea of what was happening. On July 18, 1944, our target was an airfield at Memmingen, Germany. We had severe weather over the Adriatic and on the Alps, and that caused us to miss the, the rendezvous times with the fighters that were supposed to be escorting us. Uh, the weather was bad. Most of the Air Force were, re were recalled home. Some, banned, some bombed alternate targets. However, the 483rd proceeded to our primary target at Memmingen. There we were attacked by over 200 enemy fighters, Messerschmitts and Falkwolf 190s. Of that number, 66 were shot down by the American gunners, but we lost 14 of the 26 B-17s over the target area. I was one of the 14 that was lost at that time. In my aircraft, we had five killed and three wounded out of a crew, a crew of 10. Of the 143 airmen that participated in the 483rd bombing of Memmingen, 63 were killed in action and 80 became prisoners of war. I landed, landed in a tree, it must have been about 150 feet in the air. It gets, it gets higher every time I think about it. I was able to get down out of the tree and I must have been on the edge of the air battle because uh, I, I, I was able to get away. I was not captured immediately. I picked up some clothes off a clothesline and headed west toward Switzerland. I was loose for six days. I won't bore you with the story, but after six days, I was picked up on, on the border of Switzerland by police who demanded identification, which of course I did not have. It soon got beyond my limited German. When I arrived, they took me to the police station. I immediately stripped off the work clothing I'd stolen off the clothesline, stood there in my khaki uniform and said, Ich bin ein Amerikaner Flieger. Ich gehe nach der Luftwaffe oder der Wehrmacht. I'm an American 
fly, I go to the Army or the, or the Air, Air Force, the German Air Force. Actually, the police sergeant thanked me at that point. He said, Danke, Danke. And I ended up eventually at Stalag Luft 1 in northeast corner of Germany. This was a prison camp holding 9,000 Americans at, at its peak. Americans and, and British, I should say. About 1,500 British, about 7,500 Americans. Uh, we were liberated in May of 1945 by the advancing Soviet troops. And after a couple of weeks of negotiations, they finally decided they were going to fly us out of there. Interesting enough, we were flown out by B-17s, stripped down aircraft. Instead of a crew of 10, they had four. And as fast as they could land at this little airfield, they put 32 Kriegsgefangenen, that is prisoners of war, on each airplane. Can you imagine what, what 36 people looked like crammed into a, into a B-17? Anyway, within two and a half days, they evacuated 9,000 of us. Now, if we flash forward to 1988, the war's long since passed, but the citizens of a little town called Buchenberg in southern Germany decided they were going to, they were going to set something up for, for the history of the event. The air battle where we were hit by 200 fighters and shot down 66 of them, lost 14, was quite a scene. As far as parachutes coming down and uh, people in that area were all up in arms to pick people up. We had army, police, even the Hitler youth rounding up prisoners. There was one young, young man, 11 years old, by the name of Kurt Halber, who was going home for lunch from school on his bicycle, and he saw this air war and all this hubbub going on above. He was very impressed by that. What he did then was he related the story to his nephew. His nephew, by the name of Ludwig Halber, was a battlefield archaeologist. He's interested in unearthing evidence of World War II. And uh, he does research online. And uh, he talks to people, finds out where these crash sites are, and he goes out and he investigates, and he comes to these crash sites, and he digs up parts. Well, Ludwig contacted me in 2005, and the reason he found me was he found a, um, a rusty old machine gun with a serial number on it, and the serial number he was able to equate to the tail number of my airplane. He had a friend in Munich that had a database on 3,000 crash sites. And he was able to identify me through our veterans organization, and he got in touch with me. We've been friends ever since. Ludwig came to visit me when we were in uh, Arizona, and he brought 50 pounds of debris from my airplane in his luggage. Some of that is displayed here on this table. Now, Ludwig uh, is still operating this way, and he's able to help uh, identify some of the folks that are still missing from crash sites in Germany. Now, this particular airplane of mine was hit by fighters, and we lost two engines quickly to cannon fire, and the, the tail section broke off. The, uh, the airplane was in terrible shape. I tried to get, get, keep it as level as I could for as long as possible, enabling some of the surviving crew members to escape. Finally, I kicked off into a spin, and I went down with it. I got out from, from an altitude, bombing altitude of 25,000 feet. I think I, I estimate it was about 5,000 feet altitude before I got out of the airplane, and I ended up in that tree. Now, in 1988, the people of Buchenberg produced a little book. Uh, I, I don't have a copy of it with me, but it was called uh, Luftschlacht über Buchenberg, Air Battle over Buchenberg, and describes all aspects of that particular battle. It's all written in German, of course. 
And they also, five of the 14 B-17s that we lost were crashed in the vicinity of this little town of Buchenberg. The remains of the people that they found in the aircraft, people who were dead, were buried in a churchyard, adjacent to the churchyard in a common grave. And later on, the bodies were exhumed and taken back to uh, American cemeteries, both in the United States and, and in Europe. At that time, they decided they were going to produce a plaque and hang it on the wall in the village square. And I, I, I guess my previous presentation, I showed the, the plaque, and uh, I just talked about it today. The plaque was sitting in an area near the center of town where their heroic dead from the 1870 war, World War I and World War II were honored along the wall. They put this plaque up for the 29 American dead, and it was organized so that you could see the, uh, the, the, the name of the pilot and the dead that were found there in each of the five airplanes. My name is on that plaque. It says Ricky Crew and the, the five dead of my, of my own airplane are, are, are listed along with their rank and their, and their position on the aircraft. Now, L Ludwig eventually found my airplane. And when he did, why, he picked up all of these parts, some of which I got, got displayed here on the table. This is a piece of a flak helmet. And when I say flak helmet, we wore that on the bomb run as protection. It was a typical GI helmet, except that it had flaps in the ears were wide to, to enable us to put the earphones underneath the flak. Uh, this is a, uh, a manifold cover. This is a piece of a clips that housed the 50 caliber bullets. We had 13 50 caliber machine guns on each airplane. This is all chrome plated because Ludwig wanted to make a special presentation when he sent it to me. Most of this stuff is in terrible shape. And uh, pieces of the fuselage, a piece of plexiglass, some, some of the smaller parts. were pieces of steel from the in, inside the flak vest that we wore. And this particular article here is called a walk-around bottle. It's a portable oxygen container. You must understand that uh, these aircraft were not pressurized. In a modern-day airliner, if you can fly at 30 and 40,000 feet in a pressurized cabin it gives them the equivalent of 8,000 feet elevation as far as oxygen is concerned. But the, the B-17 was not pressurized. We all wore masks tethered to a hose, which went to an oxygen container. This is a typical one. This container appeared at each uh, workstation on the airplane. It held something like eight hours of oxygen. The walk-around bottle was only a half hour worth of oxygen. It was used uh, in rare instances, maybe to help a wounded comrade to get up and leave your position. You have to untether yourself from the big tank and then hook up to the little tank before you can walk around. Perhaps a bomb got hung up in the bomb bay. Somebody had to go back and get, get that bomb to drop. That's when they would use the walk-around bottle. I think that's all we you know, okay. just cover that one piece. So I wanted to, to show you that you this helmet looks like that one over there, doesn't it? Oh yeah, there it is. There it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's what one of those helmets look like. You see the air air flaps here. Here, we'll move that. You can see it. You notice the big air flaps. 
The reason this debris is in such terrible shape is that uh, our aircraft still had bombs on board. And uh, when it landed in the forest, why, uh, my bombardier was captured almost immediately. And he was in the sidecar with a German officer. And he, he was taken back to that, my particular airplane. And he saw fuel trickling out underneath. And he tried to warn them. There were three Germans inside the airplane salvaging what they could. And about that time, why, uh, uh, they drove over the hill, and he, he, he couldn't communicate, tell them, they better get out of there, it's going to go. Well, sure enough, it blew up. And when it blew up, why, the bits and pieces were all that you see here. That's why they're in such terrible condition. In 2007, a young woman who's the granddaughter of my navigator and her husband visited Germany. And they went to Buchenberg, and they were given a tour of the facilities there, showing the plaque on the wall and so forth. And then they were carried out to this website, uh, pardon me, to this crash site. And they, he got, Ludwig got out there with his metal detector and a shovel, and he dug up some more parts and gave it to them to take back home to, 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 the, to, the, to their grandpa. That's it? That's great. OK. So Stanton, you. Um you like to tell your story a lot, and you've done it many times for our events. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so important to tell that story? Well, people don't understand. The, the situation of, of oxygen, for example, a modern-day airliner is pressurized. You can cruise at 30 and 40,000 feet, and your oxygen level is, is uh, at 8,000 feet. These planes were not pressurized. That was a big part of our problem. And you, you, instant death would come to you at 25,000 feet if you remove the oxygen mask. Uh, these are th things that the modern, modern day people don't understand. They take, for example, the fact that no, no, no problem right around that airplane at any, any altitude. And World War II was different. Uh, particularly the, the youth of today, World War II is dispensed with, with a paragraph or two in a history book. Uh, seeing what's, what happened, listening to the talk of actual survivors, I think is important in telling the story. It was a rough time of life. You're right. There's so much that you tell me that I listen to that I would have never known, like the flak. That's the first time I heard about the flak. I heard about flak seats and things, but I didn't understand about the flak vest. Oh. Um, and the oxygen bottle carry around. Yeah. For, Those are rare items. FLAC is a G German acronym. It, it actually stands for uh, uh, Flug Optilen Luft Abwehr Kanonen, anti aircraft cannon. It, it's just creeped into our, our vocabulary. Uh, FLAC, of course, was the biggest problem. A after the particularly Memmingen raid, the Luftwaffe never again was able to mount a force that, that would, uh, the magnitude of the 200 they threw against us. Part of their problem, of course, was oil. In, in any event, why, uh, uh, the target of Pelesti, uh, which where the Germans received one, hundred, one third of all of their fuel, and we went there 27 times, 15th Air Force did. I went there twice. Now, flak at Ploesti consisted of over 1,000 guns, 88 millimeter and 105 millimeter, would throw an explosive shell at bombing altitude, and when it, when it burst, it would penetrate the aircraft. The target of Vienna was the second largest flak concentration something like 1,200 guns, 1,500 perhaps. And in, G in Germany, Berlin was number one. They had 2,000 guns capable of reaching the alt altitudes where we were, we were bombing. So flak became a bigger problem than fighters in the latter part of the war. So B-17 Alliance is building a World War II Memorial Museum with the stories like yours. It's our passion to restore the B-17 to fly it in honor of a great generation 
and tell the stories of the era. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I know why. I want to know why no, you know. No. <laughs> these, you? these are details that are obscured by history. And we have to tell the story so, so people will be aware of what happened, aware of why we lost so many people and uh, what happened in the magnitude. You'll never see an armada of airplanes, a thousand bombers accompanied by fighters. You'll never see that again today. It'll never be there. In, in February 1945, why the raid on, on Berlin by the 8th Air Force consisted of 1,500 bombers and 900 fighters. Luftwaffe didn't even challenge them. You told me a story one time about the layers and flying all together. How many planes all at once would fly? Uh, well, I mean, total? Yeah, like one mission, how many would fly together? Well, the 15th Air Force would mount maybe, maybe 500 air bombers plus fighters. And in, in, in the 8th Air Force was, was bigger, and they would, they would have as many as 1,000 in a typical raid. And, uh, B-17s flying together? B-17s and B-24s, uh -huh. yeah. But mo mostly B-17s in the 8th Air Force, and mostly B-24s in the, in the 15th Air Force. Can you imagine? That is phenomenal. You, you, that is why you, it was the war, air war. Yeah. When, you, when you see today uh, two airplanes in formation flying over a parade on Memorial Day or Armistice Day, why, can you imagine what it was like to see a bomber stream of 1,500 bombers going toward a single target? The bomber stream was probably 30 miles long. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much. Your, your service, your dedication to our country, your telling your story and sharing, your support of us, your friendship. Thank you for everything you. you do. Thank you. Really Thank appreciate you being here today. I, I do appreciate what you folks are doing. Mm -hmm. You're making this, this available yeah. uh, for, for, for the modern day person who has no idea what we went through. It's important, isn't it? It's very important. I believe Extremely that myself. Mm -hmm. and I, I probably won't make it, but I'd love to see you fly that B-17 someday. You just might. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> We're cooking. We're making it happen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate it. He has some pictures we'd like to put on there, too. Um, I'll, get, I'll get them for you. Oh. So, um, you want me to hold them or just put them on the table? or? How would you like to do yeah, that? Well, let's try holding them. I'll see if I can just. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know if I can hold still that well. Well. Is there too much glare? Not right there, but the uh, lights are going over the top or whatever. Uh, I can't read anything, but I can zoom in on the pictures. Uh, this is my German record. I was issued a German dog tag, and I have a mugshot photo here, which we attained, obtained after the war. It says I'm Kriegsgefangenen number 5049 on the mugshot. It states I was picked up by the town of Constance and so forth. My fingerprint is on there too. I was able to pick this up after we were liberated from the camp headquarters. Okay. On the reverse side of that, you want to show them that? The reverse side of that is a view of Stalag Luft 1 painted by a particularly talented uh, bomber pilot who was a prisoner. And uh, he, he produced a complete book of information and, and, uh, about individuals and the camp itself. I'm really glad you're explaining that. That's great. OK, next one. This one is his story. So we'll put that in our archives. You can tell him about this one, this one. <laughs> Now this kind of a fun caricature of me made uh, in 1945. Uh, after liber liberation, why, we, we went over the hill in Paris for about a week and had a hell of a good time. And outside the Folies Bergere in 1945, a street vendor did this caricature of me. Should we start with the youngest one? 
Yeah, but Probably this, this is one? the earliest one. Okay. I was also in the Marine Corps enlisting in the reserve while still in high school at age 17. We were called to active duty in 1940. And from 1940 to 1942, I served with the Marines in San Diego and in the South Pacific Island of Samoa. I, I left the Marines with the rank of corporal to accept appointment as aviation cadet in the Army. This is what I looked like while training, flying the uh, aircraft as a, as a cadet and later as a second lieutenant, uh, preparatory to going overseas. Vintage of 1943. Now those great shots. Here's one more. This was a, an official portrait taken probably about 1955. I was a captain at the time, and was shortly after being recalled to active duty for the Korean War. Okay, very good. Okay, very nice. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay, anything you'd like to tell the next generation? <laughs> <laughs> The, ne the next generation is going to have their own obstacles to overcome. And already we've seen some of this in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I know if the time comes, the younger generation will do their thing the way we, we, we did ours. Oh, that was very nice. Very good. Okay. You're great. You want to sit down? Yeah. <laughs> This appears to be a, a ceramic of some sort. More fuselage chunks. A hinge, probably off a buckle. I didn't bring it with me, I have it at home. I've got a 50 caliber bullet. I mentioned that the airplane had 13 50 caliber machine guns and that's why it was called the Flying Fortress. If you, if you have a formation of a dozen or more aircraft times 13 machine guns, it was quite a formidable force for the fighters to encounter. We're just honored to have you come. Well, Join us. I'll, I'll talk.